Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Freedom's Church this beautiful Sunday morning. We're so glad that you're joining us here for worship, whether you're in person or joining us online. Welcome. Some announcements for us this morning coming up a week from today on Sunday evening at 6 p.m. There'll be a youth brainstorm session. This is for youth entering 6th through 12th grade and their families, if they would like to join them as well, there'll be a special family group as, uh, during that time. There will be food, um, and it's going to be at Spirit of Joy Lutheran Church in Seguin. Um, this is a combination of four churches that have come together to form what's called the Compass uh, Collaborative or Cooperative. It's both. Um, and so we're very excited about this, and this is an opportunity to have youth across uh, this area, Geronimo and Seguin, gather together and talk about what they would like uh, going forward with a combined youth ministry. So we're very excited about that, and we'll keep you updated on the outcome. We did send out postcards inviting uh, several youth, and we have a few extra in the narthex if you would like to share that with your young person, just in case. Uh, coming up on August 26th, it's a Saturday, it's Freedom's Church Habitat for Humanity Day. Um, youth and adult volunteers are needed, 12 years and older. Work includes landscaping and also those who will provide lunches for volunteers. Brielle, will you be in the narthex after worship? Yes. Uh, Brielle, who's our coordinator for youth missions, will be in the narthex following the worship if you would like to sign up with her. Uh, to participate in this wonderful event. The end of this month, July 30th, we will be having our fifth Sunday church potluck. Immediately following worship, each family is invited to bring a meat dish and their choice of either a salad or a vegetable dish or a dessert. So please join us for that. There will be a business meeting right before that, so it should say following that. And Steve Locke's going to come now, our council vice president, to share with us more about that called meeting. Good morning. I don't know if all of you know, but we've been working on a long-term planning committee uh, for the future of our church. And it's not a short-term thing, it's kind of a long-term thing. We talk about five or 10 years or whatever, but um, kind of started about three months ago. Um, Gerald and Donna Ewald, they kind of got us started. Um, we got Patty Silman and Lynn Bar Baumgartner, uh, Jimmy Shriver, Andrea Waite, myself, and Dave and Sonia. So, um, at any rate, uh, we've kind of gone over it. We've kind of chosen a consulting firm. Um, they come out of uh, Tennessee, I believe, and they work strictly with churches. And they have, uh, they've been doing it for 20 years. Uh, I think they've got over a thousand churches that they've done. Um, and they got over 70 employees. So it seems like a good fit. Um, it's somebody outside of the church because um, we just don't think we could get it done by ourselves. We need some help. So at any rate, um, we're having a special meeting in two weeks on the 30th. And we're gonna do a video presented by uh, ministry architects. And then we're gonna have a general meeting on the uh, result of this um, takes a lot of par uh, parts on our part, particularly with uh, volunteers. The one thing I learned from it is, is uh, we got to get a lot of long-term uh, volunteers, and it means you just don't do it for one day and you're done. It, you're going to be involved for several, probably months. Uh, it is a two-month program or two-year program, and um, I think we're going to be sending out something this week, hopefully, to all of you so that you can see it before we actually uh, have the video and we talk about it. So I hope you uh, all have an open mind um, and please come. 
Um, and any friends that don't normally show up, you can get them to come. We'd like to have them here too. Um, and right after that, when we finish, we'll have our uh, ch church potluck dinner. So good luck and uh, thank you. Thank you, Steve, and we appreciate you and the council and those on the long-term planning committee coming to us with this uh, recommendation. So we'll look forward to that meeting on the 30th. Well, we are indeed here for worship. So if you're able, please stand as we sing the hymn together, hymn number 329, I Love Thy Kingdom, Lord. <laughs> Please join me in our call to worship. We gather today to worship the one who created us. The one who calls us. The one who equips us. The one who loves us without end. With joyful hearts. Let us worship God. Our praise song this morning is for your glory. Everything that we do, our songs, our prayers, our time of silence, reading from the word, our lives are for God's glory. Let us sing together this beautiful praise song. There is a time to live. There is a time. There is a time to laugh, there is a time to cry, there is a time to dance, a time for joy and grace, and in all seasons, God, we humbly seek your face. This is our offering to do, this is our offering.
indeed our hope and prayer that everything that we are is for God's glory above everything else in life. The presence of God in our lives gives us great hope and joy and love, certainly grace that God extends to us that we can extend to ourselves and other, and certainly peace. Peace no matter what happens in life, no matter what comes our way in life, we can endure with the strength and promise of God's Holy Spirit living within us as people and as a church this day and all of our days to come. My friends, the peace of Christ be with you all. Let us share and pass the peace of Christ with one another. Peace be with you. I'd like to invite the children down for our children's moment. doing good well I'm glad to have the Walker children down here it's so good to see y'all love you guys so I have a, a little gift here and this bag is filled with some gifts that many of us have special gifts that we've been given by God and so this one is filled with some of those I'm going to take paper out and I want you to each of you to draw one It's all right. It says caring for others. That's a gift we can have to care for other people, right? All right. Let's see. Did you draw one for us? Playing different kinds of sports. Do y'all play sports? Y'all involved in stuff? What do you play? Soccer. Soccer. All right. How about you? Soccer, soccer. This is a soccer family. I love soccer too. But that is a gift you have, and you learn how to be teammates, right? How to get along with your team, how to work with your team. Even if you do individual sports, uh, you have to learn how to get along with those that you compete against. All right, I'm going to draw one, okay? Singing. Do y'all like the sing? Some of us have... I've been told I have a gift in singing. You like to sing? I've heard you sing. You sing well. So that's a gift that we can share in church, in school, at home, out in the community. Singing is a good thing. I think I have I'm going to hand you one, okay? You can open it. What does that say? Being a friend. Are y'all friends to people? Yeah. You always get the ones that open big. Showing animals. Those that do stock shows for competition, 
that's a pretty cool thing. And that's a special gift, too, that takes a lot of hard work and learning about. Dancing. I know there's some dancers in here. Do y'all like, you've been a dance shows, right? Yeah. Dancing is a gift that we're given, too. All right, I'm going to get the last one here. Writing stories. Oh, I love to read stories that people, other people write. Do you like to write? Yeah, you're learning to write. Writing stories. That's what our Bible is filled with. Written by others, inspired by God. That's a wonderful gift that they have. And so just remember, every single thing that we have been given gifts to do, whether it's in church or at school or out in the community with our families, those gifts have been given to us by God, and with God's help, we are able to share our gifts with one another, okay? So let me say a quick prayer. Dear God, thank you for so many gifts that you give us. We ask your blessings upon us as we work to share our gifts for the church and our families and our communities and, and for you above all. It is in your name I pray, amen. Remember how much God loves you all. All right, Miss Vicki is there in the back to go for Sunday school for our Freedom's Faith Factory. So head on back. <clears throat> see in the bulletin our prayer list which we print up try to update it as often as we can uh, for you to be able to take home and maybe post it somewhere where you see quite often maybe your refrigerator or somewhere else and that way you can be in mindful prayer for these that are listed one in particular that we want to point out is uh, for Johnny and Joel Files granddaughter Isabella who's dealing with some medical issues and so please be in prayer for Isabella uh, as she undergoes um, some uh, exploration and trying to find treatment for her. And also be in prayer for our future of our church, for our things like the Compass Cooperative, also with Ministry Architects, presenting their program to us for long-term planning. These are important parts of our church, for the future of our church, the future of our youth, also in the missions activities that we'll be under taking like with habitat for humanity these are important things that need our prayer and attention i'm sorry i have whatever's going on a cough i'm not contagious i don't think um but i'm sorry i sound this way this morning but anyway like a frog up here uh, <laughs> everybody's dealing with the allergies right with this dry weather so let us go to the lord in prayer beginning with a time of silence so you can focus on God's presence that has been here with us this whole time. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, our creator, you are full of compassion and love for us, your children. We lift up these that are on our list for prayer asking for your care and attention for your healing power for discernment for wisdom and all things you know each situation you know each person well and we just ask that you provide the care that they need oh god may we be mindful to pray for one another as we go throughout this week to pray for our church to pray for the future with our community constantly changing around us, you have provided us a place of stability, a foundation on which to grow, to share your word in various wonderful and creative ways. Help us open our hearts and minds to what you want for the future, what you want to see us do as a congregation, as a community of faith. We pray for Compass and for Ministry Architects, all the things that we have mentioned this morning that provide a look to the future. You are the God of our past, you are the God of our present, and you are the God of our future. 
May we remember that, that we are never alone, that you have provided us the love and salvation of Jesus Christ and the guidance and friendship of the Holy Spirit. And it is in the name of Jesus Christ that we pray the prayer that he taught his disciples and us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive those who fought into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The last several weeks, we have been singing some camp songs as we prepare for the closure of Slumber Falls Camp. That's part of our, our conference uh, that our church is a part of. Uh, at the end of this month, that will be open for people to go out to. Um, and so we're, today we're going to sing Sanctuary. Um, I love this song. I've been singing this song for many, many years. Uh, it's a beautiful, reflective song about how we indeed are each a living sanctuary. So will you sing with me? It helps when I look at the bulletin. I'm going to make us sing again. Sorry. I was supposed to pray in between all that. If you're able, please stand as we sing hymn number 68, God of the earth, the sky, the sea.
may be seated as our ushers receive this morning's offering. Please rise if able. Please be seated. Please join me in our prayer of illumination. Dear God, give eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts and minds to understand your word. Amen. Our scripture reading today is taken from one of the Apostle Paul's letters we find in the New Testament to the church in Ephesus, the Ephesians, those who live there. Hear these words. The gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity, to the, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. We must no longer be children tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in him every way in, into him, who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knitted together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. I had a different sermon title on Tuesday. The one you have is You Are Gifted. It's a much nicer sermon title than I had on Tuesday. I was going to talk about worship and things like that. The first title was How to Survive a Church Worship Service. The second one was How to Survive Just Coming to Church. But I changed it into this, using the scripture passage today about God's gifts, and that we all are gifted. We have gifts. We have spiritual gifts. Whether you may know it or not, 
or realize it or not, or even accept it or not, you indeed, we all are gifted being from God's grace, and God gives us as well. And using those gifts is vitally important to as we grow ourselves in the Christian faith, becoming more like Christ, our gifts are vitally important as a church, as a congregation, as this church grows in faith and a life in Christ as well, building ourselves up in a good way, a right way, speaking this truth in love that we have. We are indeed gifted and gifted people in all of life. I remember having a conversation a number of years ago with uh, some parents uh, and a child they had in school. Uh, and they came up to me, it was one Sunday morning, and said, Pastor, we've got to tell you something really good. I said, what is that? It's about our, our daughter. What is it about your daughter? He says, well, she was tested, and she's gifted, the school says. She had a test, and this child turns out to be gifted. I thought, well, that's fantastic. What does that mean? She says, oh, well, she's much smarter than anybody else in her class, and she's well ahead of everything. In fact, we think she's even as smart as the teacher. I says, now, wait a sec. You're talking about your daughter? How old is she? Oh, she's eight, but she is gifted, and she is smart beyond her years. I thought, well, that's fan fantastic to be, be gifted in school. I, I never had such a test. I guess no one thought I could even be gifted to even have the test to take in all of life. I was just a there child, in the class child. I was very average, I guess, as a child. No one ever told me I was gifted in anything, except when I played sports. I made all-stars and things like that. And I thought that was kind of cool. But in school, no, I guess I was just there taking up space in my desk in the classroom about being gifted. I learned later on, well, this beautiful child of all of eight who was gifted at the time, well, went on to, let's say, not really fulfilling, I guess, all her eight-year-old giftedness and all of life. She was like, well, I guess, she was like me. All right, let's say, that she was kind of average, I guess, in all of life. But anyway, she was a wonderful child, but gifted in other ways even by, by God. I love that. You and I are gifted as well in our lives and not because of any test that you might have to take. You are gifted simply because of this. You are created in God's image. That's it. Bottom line. I have no test to give you today to demonstrate your giftedness. Hallelujah. Thank the Lord, right? Because that is not how God works in our life. But you do have gifts you have your own spiritual gifts. Church has spiritual gifts given to us by God, and we are to use those gifts in, in our lives. And we must use our gifts in such a way, too, to help us grow in our lives. The world is a vastly big, large space, always changing in our world. Things change all the time. And we must be prepared ourselves. We must be prepared to help our families and our children, and especially, especially children, how to understand their role, their life, their place in this world, because now they will hear and experience so many other, other voices and, and visualizations of how the world is, is to be. And, and today, too, is about how we come and what we do with our worship as God, how we promote the growth and building ourselves up in love about how we're all equipped to do some things in all of life. First, a, a word about why we're here. All right, I'm going to give you some answers of why we're here. You may have been asking yourself for a long time, why are we even here today? Why did we come? What are we supposed to be doing? Church is supposed to be church. Church is not the most easy thing to do anymore in life. Oh, I know what it is to be church. Doing church is a whole different ballgame because of so many wide and, and varied experiences of how people do church these days. It's been a phenomenon going on really for the last 40, 40, 50 years, especially in the United States and now even around the world. There is simply no one way in which to do church. The Bible gives us some uh, explanations of that and some background to that, but any, anyone can form a group and come and at least attempt to worship God and have a worship service. 
and maybe some things need to be explained here about why we do things our way as opposed to some other places how they do church. I say this to you today because of this. There's probably not a single day that goes by in our lives as pastors in which someone is either either expressing an opinion about how we do church here at Freedoms or they want to point us in the direction of some other church in which I guess they may be doing it bigger or better. That's almost an everyday occurrence. Don't you love that when someone does that to your job and with you? Don't they show up at your work and tell you, oh, here's a better way to do your job, and oh, by the way, here's a better company that's doing so. I, that just happens in all of life. We are comparative analysis people. That is, we will analyze things, compare ourselves, and especially things that are important to us with other places and people. I've been dealing with that. We've been dealing with that all of our lives. A number of years ago, we lived in Daytona Beach, Florida, and we were out shopping one day. We went to the local mall that's there, Volusia Mall, right across the street from the big super speedway of Daytona, and we were there shopping and buying something, and somehow the conversation came up about who we are and what we did. Oh, we're, we're pastors. We're co-pastors at a church there, there in Daytona Beach. Said, oh, well, hallelujah and bless you. And they said, then they gave us the name, this person did, the name of their pastor, their pastor. I recognized the name, not because it was another local pastor there in Daytona Beach. This was a pastor who was well known around the world on TV every week. That was their pastor. I said, well, that's, that's wonderful. I'm glad that you tune in. I'm glad that you're learning something, gaining something from that, because that is your connection with your faith to life in God. I won't tell you the name of that pastor. He's down the road in Houston. I'll let you figure that out some other time that you want. But that was their pastor. And so I'm thinking there, it's hard in some way, in a human level, to think you can compete with that in a human level. But then I'm reminded of this about worshiping God and the way that we speak the truth and love is this. That's not my role. That's not my calling to feel like I can't compete with someone else. That's not what I'm called to do. I'm called to be authentic to who I am and my calling here in this place, here in this place. And every Sunday we strive to do this. A word about who we are and what we do. We print a bulletin here every Sunday. We've been doing this now. We used to do it every Sunday forever. The COVID made us stop printing bulletins because no one wanted to you know, have germs on paper or passing around. We started doing this again, but the bulletin means something. It mostly means something to the people who have not been here before because you know usually what we do. The idea is this, that everything that we do in worship is to do this. Point us to an experience, an authentic experience of the living God, to the living God. You see, this is not about me. It's not about Sonia. This is why we have a church the way this church is designed. No, it's not one that looks like a nice theatrical stage that you come to in, in a theater. You have theater seating, things like that. Nothing wrong with that. But this is our style. Why? Up, up here, the area is called a chancel. This is the chancel up here, and we have what's called a split chancel. You know what that is? That is the speaking happens on one side or the other. We split that. The focus is not here. The focus is not there. Where is the focus? The focus is supposed to be there to what we call an altar. That is our altar. I, we, we cover half of it up with the screen, but there's an altar back there. It's one of the most beautiful altars I've ever seen beautiful ornate wood that's up there there's a cross back there we have two crosses by the way today i want to have you do this after church come up here as you can take a look at the altar and the cross it's beautiful we have a nice shiny bronze one in front of that too but that is our altar why is the altar the focus then of of the attention because it goes back to even old testament days years and years ago when the people had an experience with the presence of God, one of the things they would do was build an altar. Now, usually it was outside, made of stone, and they did some things with this altar that we won't do inside. They would actually burn animals at time, light something on fire as a gift back to God. The altar, when we have the wonderful hymn about raising my Ebenezer, and Ebenezer is simply this, stones, 
that they would have back there, stones in place in which they would worship. And that became the centerpiece of the worship. Therefore, throughout the centuries, the altar is the centerpiece of our focus and worship. It should always be that. It's not my performance as a gifted speaker. Glad you're listening. Call that. It's not anyone's performance as a gifted singer or anything else. It's not a performative work for us to, to entertain anybody here. There's really one audience member that counts in worship. And who might that be? Any ideas? Is it me? Is it you? God. God is the audience. We're here to perform for God. And we try to do that the best we can, one by, by the Word. And the Word not just from the Holy Scriptures, the Word that we use in our Old Testaments, our New Testament, the words of Jesus Christ, but the words that we pray, the words that we sing. Now, one of our challenges that we have anymore in life is that people will be most focused on the entertainment value of singing. Singing. Songs and music get the most feedback in life. I've known this from an early age. My father was a minister of music in church. He was a talented and gifted musician, and he took his talents and gifts into the church, trained in seminary and church music. And that's what he did in his ministry career. What I learned at a very early age is that seems to be the, the area of worship where most folks have the most complaints. It's about music and the hymns, and what the choir sings, and things like that. And I thought, oh my goodness, I don't want to do this for my entire life. But my, both my parents were musicians, sang in church, and they were part of that. Music is such that these days. I think it's because of our mentality with that too. You see, in the days of old, when the people came to Jerusalem, especially with King David and King Solomon, they wanted to come into the temple singing their praises to God, hoping that God would hear their prayers, honoring God the best they could with their lives, with their worship, with their, with their words, with their music. Any day now, it's almost been the opposite effect in churches. There's such a high, high degree of the entertainment value that comes with church worship services because we're able to do those kinds of things, some better than other. And someone like me who is not that entertaining, it puts a lot of pressure, it can at times, on, oh my goodness, what can I do to entertain the folks today? And I know that I can't, which is good news for me and for you, by, by the way, because that's not the goal of why we come to church. The focus is in our presence of God. We're here if you want to say it this way, entertain God, for God to hear our prayers, our words. That's why the words are important in the songs. We take great care about the words that we have in our music. We use these things. Anybody know what this is? Well, it's called a hymnal, and these are in many churches. It has songs, and, and songs that were often written a long time ago. Maybe not always entertaining, but I'm not worried about how the music goes is the words that are important. That somebody had to put these things to music, and the words become very important to let you know. Someone said, we, why don't we sing hymns in our church? I said, we sing hymns every Sunday. That's why if you see me last several weeks, I pick up one of these every time there's a hymn and sing from it, let you know there's a hymn. But we have a struggle at times because we are not always fully understanding just what the sources are and resources we have when we come for, for worship. Everything means something, and the meaning is this, that there is a living presence of God's Spirit here in this place, and through our worship service, we're trying to invoke that Spirit that is together, our spirits together with the living Spirit of God, in order we may worship God, and then we depart supposedly, and it should be in joy and celebration that we have acknowledged yet again that God is with us, God loves us, God is for us, God works through us in all of our days. That is what we strive to accomplish on a Sunday, each time that we're here. 
And I know, I know the, the things, well, we have our own personal likes, uh, dislikes, our tastes, and our not tastes, and I get that. And I think we've become conditioned now to be entertained, have we not? We're, we're part of an entertainment culture, and so much time and energy and effort is put, in, put into entertainment. Anytime now, that whenever there's music played, we think we're supposed to be entertained by the music. It's not just where we go for concerts and dance halls and things like that. It's all over our televisions and our screens. Almost any time now, if we're watching a television and someone's singing, usually that means there's judges in front of them. Hopefully they go on to the next round all the time. It started with American Idol. Remember American Idol? And now it's gone on to America's Got Talent sometimes or The Voice and other things. But what that does, if we see that often enough, that begins to condition our minds. We become judges in ourselves over everything that happens, do we not? Oh, I like this singer. What are you talking about, Simon? You don't like this guy. We love this person. Simon Cowell, by the way, looked that up later. And so these are how we view things. Or we'll see a performance of any kind now. We're, we're not there to judge. We're there to be a part of it and to allow it to happen. I heard criticism a number of years ago. I heard criticism a number of years ago at a junior high band concert. A junior high band concert. Oh, whoever's playing that trumpet. Oh, they're not quite on the rhythm. Oh, I've heard this better in other places. I thought, wow, are you really putting that much mental, emotional, and yes, spiritual energy in critiquing junior high kids playing instruments. You've totally missed the point, I believe, of being there. And I thought, what a delight you must be to live with every day <laughs> of your life. Something about human nature just does that to us. I, I, if I have concerns about our world today, it is this, is now we are so driven by that kind of mentality. We have to be entertained all the time. Think about all the screen time that is spent now by ourselves, especially our children. And now I'm being told by those who are going to be experts about church and preaching and worship that I now have to look into being engaged into the artificial intelligence world and being the live streaming world. In fact, not only should I be not only preaching today in front of you, we're already live streaming on Facebook. Good morning. Thank you for watching. But now, from others, I also need to be having my phone up here live streaming, watching me either on TikTok or Reels or something as I'm doing this to reach a wider audience. I read that thinking, have you seen me in person? No one's going to be, I, I'm, I can't be doing all of that. But that's what we're being told now is how we reach the world out there. And I said, okay, I get that. I'll be willing to explore that on some other terms. But it's a reminder to me as you look around in our world today how much we're on screens. And what does the screen effect do? It makes us where we have to be constantly entertained, do we not? There's a reason why most images that we see on television or screen literally last two seconds. Have you noticed that? Cartoons are that way. Take a look some time at children's cartoons. How quickly do the images change in cartoons to keep a three-year-old engaged? It's literally like half a second. Something's changing quickly. We're on our screens a lot, all the time. And I can't, I can't throw too many stones at that because what do we do here every Sunday morning? We roll down our own screen and we flash up everything we do. Every word is up there on, on a screen. It makes it kind of a passive exercise in a way, but that's what I'm living with now. Screen time in our world. And now we have an artificial intelligence world where you can't even know for sure what you're watching on screen is real or not. They become so good at it. I did a little deep dive the other day into this world, and I thought, oh, this is good. These people are great at what they do, and they can, they can reel you in. They can get you watching for a long time. And, and, I, and I do worry about that because that affects our thinking, 
all the time, that we can't be entertained all the time, or we shouldn't be. What does that do to our minds, our brains, our thinking? We don't know yet what that happens. But that's the world we live in. The technology is there. It's there. And some are very gifted at that kind of technology. Just up the road there in Austin, you can get on the toll road. You want to drive a little ways past, past the big uh, racetrack up there. And then you'll get to Elon Musk's big, big uh, automotive world up there on the side of the road where now they're going to be building cyber trucks. Cyber trucks. I thought, oh, that even sounds cool, right? Cyber trucks. I think I've seen some cyber trucks driving down the road, the size and sound of these things. Cyber trucks. That's amazing. The technology is going to happen. That kind of scares me in a way, right? You know, about what does a cyber truck, can, what can it do, and, and what does it mean? How do you drive this truck? Uh, is it going to be any better than the trucks we have now? Will it make a difference in our own world, like right here, because on our week, weekend nights, especially on Barbarossa Road, all the trucks who like to race up and down Barbarossa Road, by the way, and the church is used as a pit stop, apparently. In fact, that's where they're going to try out their tire. We have, we have tire testing out here in our parking lot uh, most, most weekend nights out there. The, the scary part of me, my friends, and for parents, too, is this world is that there's a big world there, an underworld called the dark web that can be a scary place if you're there. And it's available to anyone who has a smart device, phone, tablet, and access to the Internet. I don't care how old you are. You read the story recently, read the story recently of an arrest that was made to some older person, an older man, uh, well, he was younger, but he was, he was older than 18, arrested, because he had lured a 10-year-old girl to a home, this 10-year-old girl through Snapchat lured her there. And now they don't know how many others have been involved. All it takes, a phone, an app, and internet. That's it. All the good things that can happen, there's also bad things there too. It becomes a matter of the heart and we have to use our gifts and abilities in the right way. I want to, to go ahead, Betty, and go on to that next slide, which is the uh, key verse for today. Here's what we do, my friends, as, as Christians. But speaking the truth in love, we, followers of Christ, must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into this Christ from whom the whole body, joined and knitted together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth and building itself up in love. Paul is using the body imagery and the metaphor, talking about the people of God growing up and becoming strong together, joined and knitted by every ligament. That's the word he is using. I think ligament is, a, is an important word here. Do you know that the word, the word religion, the root word is ligament. Ligament, something connected. Religion is being reconnected to our source, to our strength, to our body, which is God. That's what religion is. People say today, well, you know, I'm spiritual but not religious. Have you heard that phrase? I'm spiritual but not religious. Anybody have heard that? Is it just me? Yeah. Okay, you've heard that. I usually read that in the context of someone saying, you know, I believe in God, but I ain't going to church. That's usually kind of what it means. I won't be religious. And I thought, you can't be spiritual without being religious. You just don't know what it means. So you being religious means, oh, I'm not going to church. I'm not believing what they do. I'm not singing their songs. I'm not giving them money. I'm not signing up for things. But, oh, I'll go outside and pray, you know, when I feel like it kind of a thing. Religion simply means this being reconnected, re-ligamented to, to God. That's what religion is. And we're joined together like strong ligaments in our faith and our spiritual life to do this. And Jesus is with us. Jesus says now we have to, but Paul says we have to speak the truth in love. It's one thing to speak the truth. It's another to speak it in, in love. And I think that's very important. Some of you remember 
the conclusion of that movie uh, with Tom Cruise and Jack Nicholson, a few good men. They're in the courtroom scene, and Tom Cruise is playing the lawyer, and Jack Nicholson playing that Marine colonel. And, and, and toward the end, and Tom Cruise is trying to get him to say exactly what happened. And Tom Cruise, as you sing that movie, I want the truth. Remember that? Isn't that a great scene? I want the truth. And what does Jack Nicholson's character say right back at him? You can't handle the truth. That's an amazing, amazing scene. It's an amazing sequence because a lot of what that character says is true in that statement. Apart from not the whole truth, can't handling the truth in people's lives. Well, in God's way, we can handle the truth. God believes we can handle the truth because God gives us the truth, and we know that truth most fully in who? Jesus Christ. I am the way, the life. I'm the truth. But speaking the truth in love is paramount. Jesus says that, that God is spirit, and we worship God in spirit and truth. And Jesus says to his disciples when he sends them out one of the first times, knowing they're going to face a hard and cruel world and people who will not accept, accept them, saying you have to be wise as serpents and gentle as doves in our approach, using our gifts. And this one last statement about the words of Jesus Christ, if anyone wants to be my disciple, and here's where the truth is, if you want to be my disciple, you have to Deny yourself, take up your cross daily, and follow me. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Maybe we should put that out there on our doors before you come in. First of all, you have to, to deny yourself today before you can come in. That is, deny yourself, take up this cross of coming to worship the risen Jesus, and then we leave and follow Jesus here. How do we do this using our gifts, our truth-filled gifts, our equipped gifts. You are equipped. You do have gifts because we definitely are needs to serve God in our church, in our community, and the world. What can you do? We, we, when we make announcements, our announcements just aren't those things, hey, isn't this cool that somebody's going to do these things? Announcements, in a way, are an invitation to us all to participate in the life of the church. And by participating in the life of the church, you are participating in your life with God, your calling. We just have to determine as a church what your gifts are. Here's one way to think about it. What are your passions? What are your abilities? What have been the things that someone has else has pointed out to you in which you do well, your strengths? Those become spiritual gifts when you put those in the eyes of the Lord of what to do. And then where are your passions, your gifts, and abilities? Where do they intersect the world's greatest needs? That's your calling, whatever it may be. We do some things here. We work with children and youth. We build ramps. We're going to be building houses. We serve food. We help one another. We counsel. We have a Stephen ministry. We have all these things, and we, we need to do more, and we need to uh, help equip all of us to participate in this life. You see, to follow Jesus this is, is coming to worship to get that spiritual energy we need by worshiping God. God is our focus. And then from that, we go into our lives, into our worlds, and then we be that, who we are in our places. Some will have the gift of teaching. And we have all these wonderful professions, whether it be legal, banking, accounting, insurance, sales, automotive. We have wonderful teachers. We have wonderful people that work uh, on, on the roads and in the oil fields and in all of life. We have people who work in all these industries, automotive, uh, airline, legal, medicine, all these places in life, and wherever you are, your place, you discover, and as we will build together, where, where your passions are, your God-given abilities and gifts are, and where does that meet the great needs of the world becomes your calling, our calling as a church. Perhaps, perhaps, one of the things that we can do that allows us to shine as a church here on this corner of Freedom's Church Road 
and Barbarossa Speedway, I mean Barbarossa Road. You see how much that kind of bothers me just a little bit. Barbarossa, we're not on Highway 46. We're not on Highway 123, but we're right in the middle. The middle of those roads in the middle of interstates. We're right here. What can we do? right here, and not only right now, but in the next months, next year, the next generation of life that makes us shine with the goodness of Jesus, maybe, maybe is this. At least in the short term, I can't entertain people enough to hold your attention for a long time. I'm not, I'm not that good. If, that, if I were that good, I'd be somewhere else, right? Have you ever thought about that? You know, you, 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 you have me here for a reason. But what is it that we can do? Maybe, maybe we can take our collective gifts and abilities and passions together and make a difference in this community, in the growing community. Maybe we're going to build a habitat house. Maybe we build more. Maybe we provide more food for Christian cupboard. Maybe there's other places to provide food. Maybe we're doing our uh, birthdays in a bag again for the Family Violence Center in Seguin. Maybe there's more things that we can do. Maybe we're out there in the community enough where people will see us, but I don't want them to see just us. I want them to see the Jesus in us in the community. Do you see the difference? And what a difference that makes in the world. It's God's love that's going to make the difference. I'm just a messenger. I'm just a helper to God's love in the world. That's who I want us to be. And to think about that and strive for that, strive for the good things in life, is to help us now be equipped to do that in truth and in love and in grace. I want people in our community to say, hey, there's Freedom's children. Hey, there's Freedom's youth. Hey, there's Freedom's young adults. Hey, there's Freedom's older adults. And when they sail us into, hey, I know when freedom is here, love is here, and good things happen. That takes some growing and equipping on our part to help communities in need. Let's pray together. Oh, Lord, our God, we give you thanks for your great love for us. And on this day, we've come now to share in your spirit, to worship you, to make our lives about you first and foremost. In our few moments that we have on this day and, and of our Sundays that we have, may we be strengthened, may we be encouraged through your help, through your grace and love and mercy, that we may strive to live more for you through Jesus and through your Spirit. Help us to discover our gifts by your grace. In Christ's name, Christ's name we pray. Amen. Pastor Dave, thank you for an inspirational message. I love that. When Freedoms is here, love is here. Yeah. If you're able, please stand as we sing together. Shine, Jesus, shine. And you can put that on your Facebook page later about all that too and TikTok and <laughs> reel it out there. <clears throat> Oh, oh, oh. Shine upon us, sad. 
my favorite hymns. And as God shines and Jesus shines, may we shine too, reflecting that in all of lives. You do shine, my people. You're light of the world. Katie, will you do me a favor? Will you peek, peek out that door and see if the cart the hot, is set up? Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> I was going to say, meet me at the cart. I'll make sure it's there first. Okay. So after church, where are you going to meet me? Outside at the cart. Is it hot? Yeah. But I didn't wear a jacket today, so I'm feeling good. So meet me outside. We'll, we'll chat. Everybody <clears throat> come that way just for a few moments. we got water uh, and cookies and Capri Sun. All that good stuff, you know, out, right out here. My friends, God is with you. God loves you. Remember, two weeks we got uh, um, dinner. Uh, what's it called? Potluck. Thank you. Potluck. Where you bring things. You bring things. You know how it works, right? Potluck. Uh, there are two weeks. And before that, we're going to have a special business meeting, a special presentation, two weeks, about not only the future of the church, but the, the near future as well. A lot of things to do and work on. God needs you. We need you. The Lord needs you. This community needs you in so many vital, vital ways. And that's what we'll strive to do and to be that. So my friends, on this day, as we now depart on this mission that we have with God into our world, I pray that we will live simply, love generously, serve faithfully, speak truthfully, pray daily, and leave everything else to God. Amen. Sing in every room.